So, um, again, my name is Sal Stangaroni with TEC. Today we are going to be talking about BACnet fundamentals. If you guys have any questions during the presentation, you can type them into the box, and I will look at them at the end of the presentation and go over them. Um, but otherwise, we will be recording this webinar, and it will be posted on TEC's website. And um, other than that, let's get started. So the agenda for today. First, we are going to talk about what BACnet is, the benefits of a standard protocol, um, the BACnet basics. We're going to go into a little bit of the software rules, a little bit of the wiring rules, a little bit of the addressing rules, and then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about carrier open controls. So what is BACnet? BACnet is a standard data communication protocol specifically for building automation and control networks. That is what BACnet stands for, right? Building automation and control networks. Um, more specifically, what BACnet is, is a set of hardware and software rules for vendors to follow when doing um, control systems, building automation systems, okay? And this set of hardware and software rules was developed and is currently maintained by ASHRAE um, as a specific committee for it, um, as well as that hardware and software set of rules is freely distributed and published so that everyone can um, meet them and understand how they function. And then um, the BACnet set of standard and hardware, I'm sorry, the BACnet um, set of rules and regulations is, has to meet ASHRAE ANSI standard 1995 as well as ISO and CEN standard. Um, and it is the most widely accepted um, building automation system DDC protocol currently. So if the controls contractor tells him you can't speak back that, you should probably talk to a different controls guy. So um, <clears throat> standard protocol. BACnet is a standard protocol, but the benefits for a standard protocol are um, the biggest benefit to the end user is a single seat workstation, basically meaning the end user or owner of a building can see his entire system, his entire building control system from one location. And then that, that building control system is not just limited to HVAC, right? That could include lighting, it could include process, could even include security. Um, so that's the biggest selling point of a standard protocol because if you get enough, or if you get the right equipment, right, whether it's HVAC or lighting, if it can speak a standard protocol, you can tie all that into one system, one location, okay? That being said, you don't need any gateways. Gateways are translators. Um, they translate one protocol to another, um, and gateways can work great, but if you have just one language that everything speaks, it's a lot simpler and a lot smoother. Um, and the biggest, uh, the other big point with selling to end users in this was that the owner of the building is not locked into a specific controls contractor or control system, right? If you're speaking an open protocol, a standard protocol, that owner does not have to speak only to one contractor, only to one manufacturer for his controls. So BACnet is a standard protocol and it is a set of hardware and software rules. We're going to look a little bit about these hardware and software rules in the preceding slides. So let's look at a couple of the software rules for BACnet. Um, there are three main software rules um, and they are that you need to use standard objects to map data. Okay, that's the first rule of BACnet, software rule. Second would be that you need to use standard messaging or services in order to read and write that data. That's rule number two. And the third rule is that you need to use a standard network or transport in order to transfer that data. So, first rule, objects. An object is a representation of a collection of organized information that may be shared on your network. It's basically a point on your control system. Okay, so whether it's a hardwired point, an input or an output, or just a specific value on your network, like a, a set point or a time, um, it needs to be mapped as an object. Okay, so you see the examples, you've got an analog input, Space sensor would be an analog input. That needs to be mapped as an object. Your output to a valve, to modulate your valve, that needs to be mapped as an object. And then finally, you've got a um, calculation. If the temperature is greater than 78, then enable something. That's a value or a set point, and that needs to be mapped as an object as well. 
So BACnet defines 23 standard objects. Okay, you can see the list of them here. You've got binary inputs, binary outputs, binary values, analogs, multi-states, schedule points. But these 23 standard object types, this is how you would um, this is how you would map the data of a point on your system, on your BACnet system. Okay? So we're going to look at a specific object, okay? Let's say we have a space temperature sensor, right? Our object, space temperature sensor, actually has properties, okay? And you can see the list of the properties below. We have an object name, right? We would call it space temp. Then we could have an object type, which would be one of those 23 types that we saw previously. This one would be an analog input. Then our property, or our object would have a specific present value and then it can also have a high and low limit. Okay, and those high and low limits would be what would cause an alarm on your system. So when you're mapping a specific point on your BACnet network, it needs to be mapped as what's called an object, and each point has specific properties. Okay, whether it's the name or the present value of that point, it has specific properties. And communicating with these points or these objects, um, you need to look at these different properties. And you need to use the second rule of BACnet to do that, which would be services, right? So a service is something that reads and writes an object on your network, okay? So if you see the list on the bottom left there, we have read properties, um, read multiple properties, write properties, write multiples. Um, this is how you would see a specific object on your network. So let's say that I wanted to know what my space temperature was in a certain room. I would use a read property service to read that object, and I would say, okay, I want to read my space temp, object name space temp, present value of that object. And then I would come back and I would be reading 78 degrees. If for some reason I wanted to override that value and say that I had a different sensor in another room that I wanted to use for that property, I would use a write property and I would say, okay, I want that value to read 70 degrees. I'm going to do a write property to space temp and the present value. Okay. So these services are how we communicate between the points on our control system. And how these services are transferred are called transports. Okay. Um, the two main types of BACnet transports that you'll see out there are BACnet IP and BACnet MSTP. Um, uh, you will see MSTP more often than as a standalone network, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but BACnet IP is actually an internet protocol network um, where you could have your control system running on the same network that your internet's running on. Okay, so just summarizing, the three main software rules of BACnet are any information or points on your network need to be represented as objects and all of those objects with, when communicating need to be communicated to and with through services. And then the services are transferred or transported on a transport system. Okay. This is just the basics, guys, so it's not as detailed. A lot of this stuff is behind the scenes um, with current control systems, but kind of understanding how the process works is key for really getting into BACnet and integration and more information about it. So. Let's look at some of the wiring rules, okay? Um, and we're going to look at wiring for BACnet MSTP. MSTP stands for Master Slave Token Passing, okay? And um, what that means is you have different controllers throughout your network or your building automation system are either designated as masters and slaves. And throughout that system, a token is passed between the masters, or the controllers that are listed as masters, okay? Now, only that token, whenever a controller has that token, that means that specific controller is the only one that can communicate with anything else, okay? The only one that can do a service to someone else, right? So, throughout my entire network, I'm going to pass a token to each controller, to each master. That master, when it has a token, is going to decide, okay, I want to read the space temperature of a different controller, right? Or I want to read my space temperature. So when it has a token, it can do that. It can do services to its objects, right? Once it's done that, it will pass the token to the next device, and the next device will do all of its services. 
Um, that's why it's called token passing. Okay, and the slave devices, those specifically get pulled by each of their masters. Okay, they cannot hold the token. Um, kind of understanding, helping you guys understand on the next slide you'll see um, is the standard wiring for BACnet MSTP is a peer-to-peer -peer network. We're going to look at a picture of it next, but it's also called a daisy chain. And what that means is your network wire actually goes from controller to controller um, in one full chain. It does not home run back to any specific location. Okay, so you're literally going into one controller, out of it to the next, out of that one to the next, and so on. Um, and the standard wire that you want to use for this application for BACnet MSTP is a two conductor. Um, it's an RS-485 COM bus. Um, you need it to be shielded, twisted pair, and it can talk up to 76.8 kilobytes per second, and you can have a maximum of 60 controllers per BACnet network. Okay, we're not going to get into that as much. Um, different networks, but you can have one building, right, with multiple networks. So you're not limited to 60 controllers at all on a building automation system that's BACnet. That just means on one local wire, local communication bus, you can only have up to 60 controllers and then you need a separate bus. Both of those can be tied into your building automation system, but you need to divide it that way. So here's kind of a little portrayal of that peer-to-peer -peer network, the daisy chain. All of my M's are actual controllers here, so you can see my communication bus goes from the controller to the next, and then out of it to the next, out of it to the next, out of it to the next, eventually throughout the whole network. Um, and then I would have my building automation system somewhere else on this network. Um, but you can see, again, my token gets passed from controller to controller to controller, and whenever you have the token, you can speak. Okay. Um, these little repeaters and terminating resistors, they're just um, little wiring tools that you need to um, boost your signal, make sure your communication communicates properly. So we're not going to really touch base in with them right now, but that's a little bit more advanced. Um, but the big thing from this picture you want to get is that you're going from controller to controller, right? In and out, no home running to one central panel or anything like that. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about BACnet addressing, okay? Um, <clears throat> there's a couple different addresses you need to know for BACnet, BACnet um, communication systems. Um, the big thing with addressing is um, involved with integration, but kind of understanding the different addresses here, the standard addresses will help you out with doing that. Um, so there's two different types of, of BACnet that we wanted to talk about today. We've got master-slave token passing like you just saw, and then we have IP. So there's two different types of addressing for each of those, right? So the first number that you need to know about a BACnet address is the network number. And what that means is, like I mentioned before, you can have one building automation system with multiple networks. That's basically multiple communication buses per, per building, right? Each of those communication buses or each of those networks needs an address so that the system knows how to refer to that communication line, right? So for MSTP, you would have a five-digit network address, and the standard address for a carrier system would be 16101. That would be how I would refer to a specific network, okay? And then for IP, you would have a four-digit um, network address, which would be 1600 um, for a standard carrier system, right? So this is local to each communication bus has their own network address. Then on that network itself, you have multiple controllers, right? And each controller needs a specific address as well. Um, so on a MSTP type communication bus, you would have a two digit controller address. Um, I believe it can go up to three digits. I think it can go to 147, I believe. But um, for an example, um, we would just, you would have a two digit address like uh, five or 25, right? Um, but each controller needs to have its own specific address, otherwise the communication bus cannot talk properly, okay? You need to have, each controller needs its own address so you know to go to each individual controller, right? If you got two controllers with the same address, you're not going to be able to talk to them. It's just like if you had two houses next door to each other with the same address, the mailman's not going to know where to deliver the mail, right? Um, so for the IP network, the specific IP address is going to be 
an IP address, right? Just like you would for a specific device on an IP network for a computer, right? So an example would be 10.44.24.01. So that's a specific controller on your IP network would have that specific address, all right? So the big addressing for BACnet is what is called the device instance number. And that is a combination of the network number and controller address, okay? So any BACnet system, if you want to refer to a specific controller on that system, you would have to look at the device instance number. And what that tells me is, okay, I want to find, let's say, controller A, right? If my controller A is address device instance number 1610105, then I know, okay, I want to look at network 16101 and then address 5 on that network, right? So these addresses are paths for me to locate the controllers that I want to talk to. And the device instance number is literally just adding the controller address to the network number. So before we had, for MSTP, we had 16101 was our network address, 05 was our controller address. We put them together. We have a device instance of 1610105, okay? On the IP side, same thing, right? We have 1600 was our IP network, and then 10.44.224.01 was our actual controller address. We put them together. That's our device instance number on an IP network, okay? So this is how you can look at multiple networks on one system or multiple controllers for each individual network, okay? The BACnet device instance number. All right, so kind of went over the basics of BACnet, right? Um, there's a lot of systems that can speak BACnet. Basically, all the manufacturers can do it currently. Um, Carrier's new open protocol line, um, I guess it's not technically that new, but it's from around 2008. All of the controllers themselves can speak native BACnet, right? That's how they communicate with each other. They're, they're open protocol, standard, pro, or, yeah, standard protocol, and they're BACnet specifically. Um, so we kind of just wanted to look at the different options of what we have here. They all follow the rules we just went over. Um, they can all be tied into a carrier system or a third-party control system, right? So like we said before, when we were looking at the benefits of a standard protocol, the benefits of BACnet, you have one system that can read any controller or any manufacturer controller that can speak BACnet. All of these controllers can tie into a Johnson system that can speak BACnet or a train system, right? Um, so we're looking at just a couple of them that are shown here, right? We've got an RTU open. That's for an RTU right, uh, a constant volume rooftop unit. You've got the water source heat pump open, that's for a water source heat pump, right? And you've got some VVT controllers, VAV controllers, fan coils. So all these controllers are not only standard BACnet, but they're all pre-programmed for a specific application, the application you can see there, and they also come with a standard graphic on them, okay? Now that graphic can only be seen on a carrier system um, because different systems have different types of graphics. So if I wanted to take this RTO open board over here and tie it into a Johnson system, that controller is going to have a graphic on it, but the Johnson system is not going to be able to see it. It's only going to be able to read and write to the objects that are communicated through BACnet, um, but the graphic is on the Johnson side. Whereas if a carrier system, if you tie it into a carrier system, that graphic is going to auto-populate. You're going to be able to see everything on it. Okay. All of these devices you can get either field or factory installed. Um, so if you're buying a carrier rooftop unit and you have a Johnson control system, right, and you want it to be able to tie in direct, you can get one of those R2 open boards factory installed on there. They bring their communication wire to it, mount a sensor to it, and you're good to go, right? Um, so you can do that with air handlers, fan coils, unit ventilators, water source heat pumps, VVT dampers, VAV dampers. The majority of the equipment that TEC and carrier manufacturer and sell um, can have one of these cards factory installed to tie into the system, okay? And that being said, we also have custom programmable controllers um, that you can basically use for any application, right? So it is only limited to the inputs and outputs on the controller specifically. Um, you can put a control program on there that can turn an exhaust fan on, it can turn lighting relays on. Um, Specifically, TEC as a company does all of the controls with these carrier open controls for all the crate and barrel stores throughout North America. 
and we use custom programmable controllers to control lighting schemes for them um, based on schedules and outdoor air light. Uh, we actually monitor power usage for all of them. So um, you can get very complicated with these controllers if desired and if needed, but again, you can just use standard application controllers as well um, for standard HVAC equipment. So um, <clears throat> looking at Carrier's interface, um, its user interface is basically what the building automation system is. It's, um, it's called the iView, and this is how you access your building automation system, right? So it is a little web server. You can see it down here. It's this little black box, and that would plug into your Internet as well as your, um, your MSTP network if you had a BACnet MSTP or your IP network. And from there, you would be able to access all of your controllers, um, and you would have standard animated graphics on there. Um, it's plug-and-play installation, like I said, so all the controllers have con control programs and graphics built into them. So you plug this iView into it, it auto-populates the graphic and the program. You can see everything, change set points, schedules, all of that. Um, allows you to do remote troubleshooting, and you can see that like I mentioned before, all of the carrier controllers are native BACnet. This iView can actually speak BACnet, LAN, and Modbus. Okay, so it, it's in, it in itself is not only limited to BACnet, it is open to both Modbus and LAN works. Um, we're just going to look at a couple different screens that kind of show you a little bit more of what's involved with the iView here. Um, so here would be an example of a rooftop unit graphic, right? This is that graphic I was referring to that's stored on the controller plug it into the iView and this auto detects. You can see you've got statuses of the rooftop, um, set points, uh, and, and the fans move, the coils light up, um, the dampers actuate, right? But all of these points that you see on this graphic are all BACnet native points, right? So they're all objects on your BACnet system. So if I wanted to plug in, again, this to a Johnson system, right? and they wanted to say what my economizer command position is, right over here, this 50%, they would say, okay, I want to do a read property to controller 1610106, say, and I want to look at the economizer command position, right? So object name econo command, then I want to see the present value. My present value would come back through BACnet as 50%, okay? So this graphic is really just a doing all that back net behind the scenes on the carrier system and showing it to you on a computer. It would be the same if, if a Johnson system had tied into it. They would, they would see the exact same point. They would see the exact same value. Um, so again, it's an auto-generated graphic, kind of just a little view here we've got of it. Um, on each of these iViews, you can actually build custom graphics too. So you can do specific floor plans for buildings, right? So you got your two floor plans on here. We've got a second floor and a first floor. And these little bubbles are um, actual temperature representations for the different locations of the building, right? So I would have, let's say, a VAV zone for this little, this little foyer area. This is the live temperature value of that, right? And you can see the temperature is scaled in color based on the set point, right? So I've got this color scheme on the left here. I've got a yellow color, which means that I'm a little bit warm compared to my set point, right? In 79, you are a little bit warm, so we probably have a set point of 76 or something in there. And this is a great way so you can basically just diagnose things that are going wrong with your building and check if people who are complaining about different locations are really warranted in their complaint um, because you can see your whole building. You can see the current temperatures and the current set points relative to those temperatures, right, to the colors. So it's a great thing for a building owner, a building engineer, or even for a service call, right? If you you come in and someone was complaining about the training center, right, up here in the top left, I can pull up the screen. I can say, oh, it looks like it is a little bit warm in there. Maybe I need to delve into the training center, and I need to go to the actual graphic of that unit and see what's going on. So another feature that's built into these iViews and the, the actual carrier controllers, open controllers themselves, is trending. The, all of the controllers can standard trend up to 24 hours. Um, now, if you put an iView on the system, depending on the iView you, you get, you can trend either up to 7 days or up to 62 days. Um, so there's two different levels of the iView, but 
trending is a huge feature, um, especially for doing any type of service work, right? Um, if you can trend the supplier, the space temperature, and the status of a unit, um, if if you get a service call and the customer says, hey, it's it's hot here and you can't get out there that day, you can go the next day and you can look at the trends and see, okay, my unit says that it's on, but my supply temperature is really high and my zone temperature is really high. Maybe my compressor is locked out. Or it gives you a great idea to see exactly what's going on and what went wrong when you weren't there. Um, these trends, you can copy them into Excel, right? You can export them into Excel. So you can actually store all of this trend data um, for years upon years if you wanted to, just so that you have a good idea of um, what is going on in your building. And you can also use it to, uh, to monitor energy. Um, another great feature that you get from most building automation systems, but also with the iView, is you can do scheduling, right, and group scheduling. So each controller can have its own individual schedule, right, but you can also do group schedules where, let's say, I wanted to have my whole second floor on one schedule and my whole third floor on a different schedule, right? You can divide them up through there. Um, you can do scheduling based on just normal days of the week. You can do scheduling on specific dates. You can do holidays. You can do every other Tuesday if you wanted to, right? It's a it's pretty complex, even though it's just simple scheduling, but it's a great energy feature and great for organizing. Um, one thing I love to tell people is, as a, as a building owner, right, um, as a company, if you get published your holidays for the entire year, one day, the first day you get that list, you can go through and you can program holidays for the entire year, and your schedule is set, right? You don't have to worry about when Thanksgiving comes around or when Christmas comes around. It's already set into the system from whenever you got those dates. <clears throat> and another huge, huge thing with this system is uh, the alarm capabilities, right? So um, just with current technology, you know, that's kind of an old picture of a cell phone there, but um, email and text message alarming is huge nowadays. Everything's run through computers and cell phones, so um, Seeing a text message saying that your 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 space is too hot, or it's getting an email saying that your compressor failed, are huge things that building owners, building engineers, everyone is looking for. Um, so that ability is huge, and the iView can do both emailing and text messaging to multiple people at the same time. Right? You can choose which alarms you want sent. Um, there's no limit. So great feature. Um, with that. Do you guys have any questions? Um, I will look at the questions bar now, but hopefully you have a little bit better idea and um, a little bit better of an intro into BACnet to know exactly what's going on when uh, controls guys are talking to you about it. Um, let's see if we've got any questions here. All right. Okay, good question we got um, from Bazad. What happens if a controller fails? Is it like series circuit? Okay, so when we were looking at the, um, the daisy chain orientation, right, that peer-to-peer -peer orientation, any of those controllers, generally speaking, all the logic is stored on each controller, right? So, for instance, if, let's say, your iView or your front-end system failed, your, all of your controllers will be able to run standalone by themselves okay so you don't have to worry about if your web server goes down all your controllers are going to remember the last piece of information they got whether it's a schedule or set point and from there they're just going to run by themselves okay now if a specific controller goes down on your network you are not going to lose your communication okay that would only happen if your actual network itself was broken right if there was a snip in the wire or a break in the communication bus um, if a controller goes down, you won't be able to communicate and talk with that controller. However, your whole system will function fine. Okay, so you do not have to worry about um, like Christmas lights. If one bulb goes down, your whole network goes down. That is not the case. Um, next question. Okay, is a three wire connection better than a two wire? The third wire being a common voltage, uh, can different ground potentials be problematic with a two wire connection? 
Um, there's definitely some debate here on the three wire connection. Um, standard BACnet says that a two conductor connection for BACnet communication is fine. Um, I know a lot of manufacturers do like to use a three wire connection, but I've never had issues with um, with using a two wire connection, and that's the standard that Carrier provides um, on all of their systems. Um, the third wire can be used for common voltage. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't run into a lot of problems with different potentials on the on the on the three wire network. Um, so I couldn't really talk to you that much about it. I know there's a lot of message boards and stuff online about it, but really, I mean, this is getting a little bit more detailed, but if you have your end of line resistors on your network, um, they create enough bias there so that you don't use, you don't run into a lot of issues with different potentials and problems from what I've seen. Now, I forgot to mention this, but um, when you're running your communication wire, right, I did mention it needs to be shielded, but you do not want to run it near any type of power voltage um, or any type of power wiring just because you can potentially run into interference there. So again, uh, we don't we don't use three wire with carriers, so I couldn't tell you specifically, but maybe if you're running it near power voltage, it might help with um, a three wire connector, but I couldn't tell you specifically. Oh, what else we got here? Is iView, can iView control commercial dehumidification system with ducts, duct heaters, outside intake, standalone condenser? Yes, the IV, you can definitely do that. Um, again, <clears throat> I showed you guys those pictures of those application-specific controllers. Um, when, I, when I mentioned custom programmable controllers, that means literally the controller can do whatever you can come up with in your head, okay? It's only limited to the different types of sensors it can use and um, the, the, the inputs and outputs. So we do dehumidification on air handlers all the time with either gas duct heaters or electric. Um, can control the outdoor air based on humidity levels and difference between the return air. Um, it's it's really as complicated as you want to get it. Um, we do have the ability to give you guys different sequences of operations for different pieces of equipment if you needed it. So if you wanted to if you wanted to um, see a specific piece of equipment that you would want to see if you can sequence it this way, we'd be happy to help you with that. But yeah, we definitely have the potential to do that. Um, and I'm just going to show you the next slide here really quick. Oh, went too far, sorry. Um, here are the contacts for the um, current carrier and TEC control support. Um, so we've got myself, Sal Sangaroni, you've got my cell phone and email on there. Jim Rylowitz works with me um, as well. So you got his cell phone and email address. Um, and then we have another coworker in Milwaukee named Dan Olivier who's been um, doing carrier controls for over 25 years now so you can you can contact any of those guys listed there um, but Jim and myself would be the the main contacts for anyone in Chicago so any types of questions you guys have whether they are um, based on sequences like we were just looking at or on pricing or what what carrier can do with its controllers we would be the people to talk to um, we got one more question here with the shielded cable. Should the shield be grounded at a single point or at each controller? Um, that depends on the control system that you have. However, carriers, open controllers that we've been talking about, all of the shields can land at each individual controller um, because those shields are grounded internally. However, if you were using a, a different control manufacturer's controllers, um, the, throughout the entire network, right, the shield needs to be grounded on one side and left open on the other. So that's the standard. Um, however, on carriers, open controllers, they all ground internally, so you don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> uh, we have one more question about how does the system differ with wireless controls. It would depend on what type of wireless controls you would want to use. Um, so, for instance, if you wanted to use wireless sensors, those would, um, it, it, your whole network wouldn't change, right? It would actually just be um, the wiring to each local controller, right? So if you had a wireless space sensor, let's say you wanted, right? You would have that space sensor mounted in the space, and then you would have a receiver for that that would wire into your controller. Um, that would be separate from the network wiring itself. Um, going into actual BACnet, um, Wi-Fi wiring, wireless wiring. Um, 
I would not recommend doing any sort of thing like that simply because I don't think the technology is there yet. Um, these communication lines for BACnet, um, there is a lot of traffic on these lines and um, doing that with wireless, I don't think we're there yet and I wouldn't really recommend doing it. Um, I have run into some big problems run going through wireless even with sensors themselves, um, some things you want to look out for. Um, you don't want any type of receiver or sensor mounted in any type of metal enclosure or near one. Um, I did a school job with wireless sensors where if you moved a television in front of the receiver or the sensor, you would lose the signal. Um, so I don't think the technology is there yet for wireless. I'm sure there are tons of people who disagree with me, but I don't recommend that you guys do it. Um, but you really, it's up to you if you, if you feel comfortable with it. Um, but I know there are some systems out there that have had good track records, but um, again, I haven't had good experiences, so I kind of steer clear of it. Um, let's see what else we got here. What if I'm upgrading an existing proprietary system and want to go carry your backnet system? Can you, can you leave the terminal equipment controllers, right? Um, so with the carrier backnet system, we talked about earlier that the IVU can do BACnet, Modbus, and LAN. Um, so if you wanted to leave the existing controllers, if they could speak any of those languages, BACnet, Modbus, or LAN, um, then it would not be a problem. You can tie those controllers in and you can have graphics and everything. Um, the problem is if you have a system that speaks a proprietary language like Tracer, um, there's really no good way to interface that to a carrier system or any system. Um, I mentioned previously a little bit earlier that we talked about gateways or translators where you're translating from one protocol to another. Um, I believe there are some, some translators you could use for a tracer system, but um, I, I, again, I haven't run into, I've run into a lot of problems with using translators and um, I don't necessarily recommend it, especially for proprietary systems if you're tying in a lot of controllers with the translators. Um, I haven't had good experiences with third-party translators, right? If you can get the translator from the manufacturer, right? If you could get Train to provide you a tracer to back that translator, then I would recommend doing it. But if you have to use some third-party system to get a translator, I would not recommend it. Unfortunately, I'd look at trying to upgrade your entire system and trying to go with the standard protocol, right? Trying to go with BACnet, whether it's Carrier or Johnson or anyone, make those controllers BACnet so you're not locked into any old system, right, any proprietary system. Uh, let's see what else we got here. I think, I think that is about it. Um, again, when you're using wireless stuff, uh, I look out for any metal enclosures or anything metal that could interfere with your signals, right? Um, you need to get your, your receivers a clear path to the, to the sensors if you really want to get good communication. So. Um, but again, we don't, we try to steer clear of wireless here at Carrier and TEC. So with that, um, thank you guys all for coming. Um, if you guys have questions again, our contact info is here and, um, we will be posting this webinar on TEC's website so you can reference it. Um, if you need the PowerPoint or anything else, you can contact me at the above and I will, uh, I will send it to you. So thanks again for coming everyone. And, um, hopefully we hear from you soon. Thanks.